Um, this is one of my great privileges uh, and highlights of my job every year, uh, and that is to introduce, you know, uh, uh, this particular uh, award uh, and talk a little bit about uh, who Rusty Sosa was and what this uh, award personifies. Um, those on the users committee got to see much of the language yesterday and how that language is getting updated, you know, uh, with some of the suggestions and ideas from uh, John Allen and the rest of uh, the users committee. Um, for many of you are worked with uh, uh, Rusty Sosa, I know uh, there is uh, one individual who, and Seppi is at Millersville, so she knows uh, uh, a lot about uh, Russ, although I don't know if your paths crossed at Millersville. Unfortunately, unfortunately I, I replaced him. Yeah, yeah. but uh, I'm very proud to say that uh, my path did cross with uh, Russ de Souza, um, and I'll tell you uh, how that happened. Um, this award, actually, Russ de Souza Award, Russell L. de Souza Award, um, honors individuals whose energy, expertise, and active involvement enable the Unidata program to better serve geoscience. Honorees personify Unidata's ideal of a community that shares data, software, and ideas through computing and networking technologies. And uh, I've said this uh, numerous times over uh, the years, since uh, Unidata was uh, created, uh, the program has benefited from commitment of a number of individuals. Um, and uh, uh, Russ de Sosa was one of those individuals uh, whose involvement with and contributions to Unidata were exemplary. Um, Russ uh, de Sosa became actively involved with the Unidata program the same day I became actively involved with the Unidata program because we were on the first batch of the users committee. And both Russ and I were at the first meeting and this that was our first direct connection to the Unidata program even though we have been using resources from Unidata prior to it. Uh, so he joined the Users Committee in 1989, and he was so good that he was asked to actually move over to the Unidata Policy Committee uh, a couple of years uh, uh, later, where he also served for many years. Uh, you know, Russ had a real vision for what Unidata can be and will be, and he actually contributed very directly, not just through governance and insights, but actually setting up what we call an educational floater to decide where the limited satellite subsector should be centered on each day, depending on the weather of the day, event of the day, um, on that, uh, uh, so that the satellite image could be the best one for the community. And each day he had his students do that exercise and give us, the, give Unidata program, essentially the centroid or the coordinates uh, to use so that we could then um, pipe it through the Unidata Wisconsin uh, channel to our uh, users. Uh, and then the same concept was expanded to uh, NextRad dissemination service, or NIDS, uh, a few years uh, later as well. Um, but uh, um, around the mid-90s, um, Russ de Souza um, developed cancer, uh, melanoma, and so he had to resign from uh, the policy committee and also he retired officially from Millersville University and he died on June 6, 1997. And this particular award has recognized 
his contributions and services to Unidata. And the first award was given to Harry Edmund, who played a significant role in ensuring that the Unidata NextRad feed became the national NextRad feed, and he developed software and decoders um, just as a community member and contributed them back. That led to the craft project at uh, Oklahoma, which then became the national infrastructure in the National Weather Service. You know, to this day, Unidata has been working closely with the NOAA and National Weather Service to make real time. So whenever you, I, I tell people, whenever anybody sees radar data on their local TV, Unidata played a small role, and Harry Edmund played a small role in making that a reality at some point. Without uh, further delay, I'm going to ask Kevin to, you know, essentially read the citation uh, that uh, recognizes our Rustis uh, uh, Awardee this year, Pete Pokran, who is very well deserving. Congratulations, Pete. And I look forward to your presentation. Thank you. It is my distinct pleasure and honor to honor Pete today uh, from the University of Wisconsin-Madison. Uh, the citation reads, for your dedication, enthusiasm, and inspiration that truly reflect the goals and ideals of the Unidata program, we present Pete Pokrant with the 2019 Russell L. D'Souza Award. Yay, Pete. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. Well, it is, it's truly an honor to be here. I mean, when I started thinking about this, so first of all, any of the rest of you, who, if you're ever awarded the Russell L. D'Souza Award, there's very little guidance as to what it is you're supposed to talk about. <laughs> Other than the, the description of the award itself, that's pretty much free reign, which is great, but it's also terrifying. It's like, what do I talk about? Um, but as I was beginning to think about what I wanted to do for this talk, um, I looked at the list of previous award winners and it's, it's truly humbling and, and an honor to be listed among this group of people. I mean, this is a who's who of people that I have interacted with over the years, people that I've respected and benefited from their contributions as well. So just, as I said, thank you for, for this honor. I really appreciate it. Um, I wasn't, I, I didn't know Russ personally, I never met him, um, but I did scour the internet looking for photos of him other than the ones I've previously seen, pretty much unsuccessfully. There's about six of them out there. Here are two of them. Um, the first one, he's with, uh, let me get this right, Bob Ross on the left, uh, Russ D'Souza second over, Rich Clark and Eric Horst, uh, looks like in their map bay. and. Uh, on the right is a picture of Russ with Shane Mayer, who actually got his PhD at uh, UW-Madison, and I knew Shane very well, so uh, one degree of separation, I guess, is better than, better than nothing. Um, I save a lot of stuff, and that'll become apparent later when you see my archive of data that we have at UW-Madison. The thought occurred to me, I wonder if I have any emails that I received from Russ back in the day. Well, the answer is yes. Um, here's an email from November of 1996 where Russ was sending out the aforementioned floater selection locations. Um, I thought, boy, would it be cool if I could actually pull up the, that image and show you guys you know, this particular image, uh, floater image. Um, I do have an archive that goes back almost that far. It starts like November 26th, so I'm close, <laughs> but not quite. So, but yes, I do actually have uh, emails dating back to uh, 1996. You can see uh, back in that, in that time, everybody kind of ran their own email servers. This isn't just coming from like Millersville. It's probably coming from his machine on his desk or something. Anyways, there's the end of that email, and that's the, the first indication that I saw. Yeah, he's, he's going in for chemo, and that's why he's sending this out. And, of course, Eric Horst is at a GEMPAC workshop in Boulder, <laughs> which is why he's sending the email out on that day. Uh, tying in with Unidata. 
Uh, here's another email uh, from January. I thought this was really interesting. Uh, we have absolutely no idea who, if anyone, is using our floater selections. But in case you are, you, you know, here's where they're going. Uh, he doesn't even know if anybody's using them, and yet he's contributing back to the community anyways. Um, and then he goes and he's got these interesting satellite images stored on a floppy disk that he can't read anymore at work. <laughs> so he takes them home, and he's on a PS2 machine, uh, no, a 286. Uh, moving them from one format of disk to another, which I'm sure is going to just continue to be an issue over the years as we change formats. But even back in 1997, that was going on. But he likes the images. The images are, the views are great. And uh, that seems to continue into today. This, on a sad note, is the last email that I was able to find from him. It was from February of 1997, where he talks about his taking a medical leave and some of his medical plans. Uh, I was unable to locate any after that, so that might be the last email that came out through, at least through the floaters uh, email list, where that information came out. So, but on a happier note, I found this picture. I don't know, is Russ in this picture? I was thinking... Yeah, yeah. Right there. Is that him? No, no. That's right. Okay. But I did see some interesting characters in here. I believe that's Tom. Yaxis, yeah. oh and Peter, oh Don Murray, Don Murray's there, yeah. Steve Chiswell, Chis. probably others that I don't know. I, I didn't actually know a lot of the the faces from back then. I knew a lot of the names from dealing with people through email. Uh, I think my first experience out here might have been 1995. This is a 1993 Northeast Regional Workshop. Um, so I stole that from from BAMS from 1994. But I thought that was kind of a fun picture to show. <laughs> so. Uh, having no idea what I was going to talk about, this is what I'm going to talk about. Um, Unidata is involved in software and data and community support. Um, my primary react relationship with Unidata has been on the data side. Since the early days, uh, I've been involved in uh, acquiring data and helping to pass that data along to the community. And I've been involved in some software stuff too, but data seemed to be... Uh, what I've felt most familiar with in talking about. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about me. Um, many of you don't know who I am and those who do probably don't know me since, you know, as a kid. Uh, so I'll tell you a little bit how, who I am and how did I get here. Um, UW-Madison's long relationship with Unidata. I'm gonna talk a little bit about uh, data access and availability and scale over the years. Uh, some examples of Unidata software and data that enable us to do research and education at UW-Madison. And then just some final thoughts about where are we now, where are we going, and uh, if we have time at the end, or if this goes by quicker than I think it's going to, I've got a bunch of just random goes 16 and 17 satellite loops that, but I, Daryl's not here, I can't. A Couple of years ago when Daryl gave this talk, he had a bunch of time-lapse video and he set them to 80s pop music, which was really cool. <laughs> I didn't set these to any soundtracks, so you'll have to you'll have to make up your own soundtrack. <laughs> or maybe I'll get this song stuck in your head. Does anybody remember the song "Once in a Lifetime" by the Talking Heads? <laughs> so I'm working on this talk, and I, I'm like, "Well, you may ask yourself, well, how did I get here? <laughs> Let in the days go by." Okay, so that song will be in your head on the on the flight home if you know it. Um, I grew up in southeast Wisconsin, a place called Menominee Falls, and my some of my vivid memories as a kid were having squall lines coming through and, and just being glued to the TV, watching the TV weatherman. You know, here it is, it's up in lacrosse, you know, it should be here in a couple of hours and just watching the stuff come, stuff come through. Did you ever notice that most of the weather people that you run into have some sort of weird thing that happened to them as a kid that got them interested in weather? You know, it was a lightning strike or something weird happened. So my, my one of my, I'm sure I had several, but one that I really remember pretty well uh, there was a tornado warning, so we were down in the basement. But my parents' basement, I don't know if we were above like an underground river or what the deal was, but every once in a while when it rained really hard, we'd start getting water in the basement. So we're sitting down in the basement waiting out the tornado warning and the water's coming up. And we're like, well, do we go outside and get blown away or do we stay down here and drown or what do we do? Uh, I think my dad called the fire department and they're like, I don't know, <laughs> good luck. Um, no, I think they recommended that we maybe go to a friend's, which we actually did. We went across the street to uh, our neighbors, which was interesting, walking across the street with water, torrential water coming down the gutters and wind and lightning and everything. 
But that was one of the events that really, uh, really got me interested in weather to begin with. Kids have heroes, right? They, they look up to people and, you know, maybe they want to be a football player, you know, you want to be Bart Starr. Maybe you want to be Robin Yown, you know, a professional baseball player, maybe Evil Knievel. He was pretty big in the 70s. You know, those guys were pretty cool. Maybe it's a band, you know, Led Zeppelin was pretty cool. I want to be Robert Plant up there shaking my hair or something. Maybe a movie star, you know, Clint Eastwood. He was, he was pretty cool. Or maybe it was somebody who has, you know, people's interests in mind, like Martin Luther King or maybe John Kennedy. I kind of thought he was pretty cool. Maybe it was Neil Armstrong. Maybe I'm going to go to the moon. So who was my hero in the 1970s as a little kid? Our local TV weatherman, Paul Joseph. <laughs> Paul Joseph was the, my hero growing up. I actually, I couldn't find it. I know I have it somewhere. I have a framed picture signed by him that I had on my wall growing up as a kid. Uh, they used to, in the 1970s, they would do the newscast from the state fair. And it was just amazing. I got to go down there and watch him do the weather, the TV weather live, and I'd go up and talk to him afterwards. And I bought his book and he signed it to me. You know, I think, what was that, like 1974? I was probably eight years old. And this is, I want to be a weatherman. And uh, to be honest, uh, he was really helpful to me. I wrote him a couple of times. He gave me ideas on what I should focus on to get into meteorology. Uh, offered to come down, for me to come down and get a tour of the station, which never worked out. I never got to go down and actually do that. But um, I wanted to grow up and be Paul Joseph. So that was sort of how I got uh, on the track to, to weather. Uh, came to school in 1984 at UW-Madison in the Department of then Meteorology. Uh, got my bachelor's degree in 1988, and that was my first experience with the unit data. Um, we had a computer lab that had a number of old PS2 machines in it, and we had some data access machines. One of them was a PC Mikitis uh, machine that was connected to the SSCC data center. And we could get real-time data in as much as we wanted, but it cost money. And we ran up a bill one time that kind of got us in trouble on a storm chase that we, they, they're like, you can't do this anymore. We don't have money for you guys to go out and buy all this, this satellite data. So that was pretty restricted. Um, but we also had this thing called the Unidata Mikaitis, and it had some satellite imagery. It had some surface data plots. It was a very early generation of Unidata Mikaitis. And it was free, and it was great when it worked. It, the, a lot of times, the, I mean, it was very early, and a lot of times the, the data wasn't flowing or whatever, but... Um, when it was working, it was really cool. We could, you know, update and look at current satellite data without having to, to get the, the office upset that we were spending all this money. So I graduated in 1988, and I really didn't, I wasn't really ready to go out into the real world. I liked college. I had a lot of fun in college, and I didn't really, I wasn't ready to be a real person yet. <laughs> so I applied to graduate school. I did not know what graduate school was. Um, I got a call one day in the summer. I was sitting out on the front porch. I think we were on our way to a Pink Floyd concert. And so we're sitting out on the front porch getting ready, and the phone rings, and it's Professor Greg Tripoli at UW-Madison. He says, hey, I saw your GRE scores, and they're really good. I was wondering if you wanted to come work for me for graduate school. And I'm like, hey, this is great. I get to get paid. I don't have to pay tuition, or it comes out of my salary, and I get to get to work with this guy. This will be great. So I did. I went and... Uh, Got my master's degree with Greg, and he wrote uh, a mesoscale model, the UWNMS model, which was formerly the CSU RAMS model. Uh, he brought that when he came to Madison in 89, I think. And when I, first sit, when I first walked into his office, I knew nothing about computers. I sat down at an IBM PC, and I couldn't make it do anything. I, it was the C colon slash prompt staring at me <laughs> and a bunch of error messages because I had no idea what to do with it. Um, <clears throat> I think my first semester working with him, I spent porting the UWNMS, or then RAMS, model from the Cray at NCAR to a recently acquired Unix machine in Madison. And that was an experience. I mean, I learned a lot. I think I wore a path in the wax from my office down to his because I would compile the model, I'd get an error, walk down the hall, hey, this happened. He'd be like, oh, I forgot to give you this, this library. And so I'd get this library and compile it again and get another uh, error. And I think it was a good semester before I actually got it to run. And then we couldn't get the NCAR graphics to compile. So I had an NCAR graphics plot of some output field from NCAR 
that I had to compare with like nine pages of printed out data that I hand contoured. And I'm like, yeah, that's pretty close. I think it's working. Um, but I got a lot of a lot of systems administration experience. I pretty much managed our department or our group machines during that that time. Uh, learned Unix, learned some of the tools that we use, uh, Fortran. You know, working with Greg's model, I learned a lot of that stuff while I was in in graduate school. Uh, during that time, and during the time when I was doing research a little bit afterwards, um, I guess I should explain how I got to there. Uh, Rush Schneider, who's at SPC right now, was going to do a postdoc with Greg. Uh, right around the time where I got my master's degree. He was offered a job at the NSEP, which was NMC at the time, and he took it. He couldn't, couldn't pass it up. And so Greg came to me one day and he's like, well, I've got this situation. I've got a postdoc, the grant is funded, and the guy who was going to do it just you know, took a job. So he goes, I can either go out and try and find another postdoc and spend a year spinning him up on the model and you know, waste a bunch of time, or you know, you are very familiar with my model and what I do. You could just jump right in and start doing it and maybe use the, the work towards a PhD. And I'm like, hey, this is perfect. <clears throat> so I did. Um, I, we modeled a mesoscale gravity wave event. It was the December 1987 gravity wave that came through the Midwest. The idea was we had this great model and we would try to produce a mesoscale gravity waves and try to understand what caused them. Uh, the first time we ran it, uh, we got a great simulation. It looked beautiful. And we traced the, the waves back to their origin, and it was a bug in the initial conditions. <laughs> and we fixed the bug, and the waves didn't happen. <laughs> Spent three years trying to figure out what was going on. In the end, we decided that, you know, it really doesn't matter what caused the waves. It's the, there was an environment with a duct, and something was going to cause those waves. It really doesn't matter what it was in this case. And my one and only uh, actual uh, published paper in Monthly Weather Review is based on that, that case. Um, during that time, we started pulling data from one of the FTP servers. He knew somebody at NSEP, and somehow we ended up getting access to some data to, to do some real-time runs with his NMS model. Um, and then I heard this, this, these rumors of some way where we were going to be able to get the data automatically without having to write scripts to FTP and check to see if the data was all there. And, that was actually the dawn of the, the IDD and the LDM, where the data was starting to be pushed out um, automatically. And, and that, was, that was really cool. That was sort of my first experience with that. Uh, the money ran out. The research wasn't really happening. And I kind of decided, you know, I really don't think I want to go on for a PhD. I don't think research is really what I'm good at. Um, I'm very good at finding the answers to the, if you have a problem, the answer is out there somewhere. My Google foo is pretty good. Um, my... my Finding answers to the questions that haven't been answered already isn't very good. Or even thinking up, what question do I want to solve? That's, I just, you know, in the years of working with Greg, I spent a lot of time in his office trying to figure out what was going on and realizing, you know, if I have to do this for, my, for a living, I'm going to starve. I don't want to do this. But around that time, we had a couple of computer systems administrator people who were very good. They were computer science people, and they were very good at managing the machines. But they didn't know the science. And so a lot of times I would go in and ask them a question or how to do something and they just, they didn't know what I was talking about. It, they didn't get it. And so a lot of it I ended up having to figure out on my own. And so I've got this blend of, you know, the, the meteorology and the atmospheric science and the sort of user end understanding the computer thing, uh, the computer systems and the management of those. And around 1995 when our grant money ran out, uh, our computer systems person wanted to leave. I needed a job. Things just sort of worked out that they put out the PVL and hired me on as the systems admin, and I've been doing that since 1995 and still do it, and it's my dream job. Um, I don't know that I could have aspired to this job when I was a kid because I don't know if it existed, um, but I get to stay close to the science that I love. I get to be involved in a whole lot of research. I don't have to write grants, well, other than like Unidata equipment grants, I write those. But, <laughs> but, but in general, uh, it, it's just my dream job. So I'm I'm really thrilled to to be doing what I'm doing. Um, so UW Madison has had a long relationship with Unidata. Um, probably most of you know, and I think you mentioned it this morning, that Unidata was actually conceived at a meeting in Madison in the Space Science and Engineering Center. Um, I was not at that meeting. I was a junior in high school, I think, at that time. Uh, but I think NSF started to realize that there was a lot of stuff going on at a lot of different universities and a lot of duplicated effort and a lot of uh, places were charging a lot of money for data and the 
especially the smaller departments just couldn't afford to get the data that they needed to be able to, to do a good job at research and education. So they got a bunch of people together to try to come up with how are we going to, you know, make software and data available to the community at large. And that was what led to the beginning of Unidata. Uh, and that goes on to this day. Um, SSCC, the Space Science and Engineering Center, who I don't work for, but they are in the same building as us and we have a lot of collaborations with them. Um, they provided a Makitis, some Makitis, or Makitis software package to Unidata for development and distribution to the community. Um, Tom, I know, does a lot of development that probably makes it back into the main line, so there's a lot of back and forth between uh, Unidata and Madison with that software package. And in terms of, you remember I mentioned that getting the, the satellite data was very expensive. Um, SSEC was involved in providing the Unidata or the, the was it UW Makitis or Unidata? Makitis in the early days and then Uni UniWISC now data feed, which provides access to satellite data. And there was some other stuff in there as well, some surface, uh, gridded surface analyses and some model data as well. So SSEC has been involved. Uh, our department, um, We've been a top level relay for the IDD for a bunch of the different data feeds on the IDD since it pretty much first started. Um, for a long time, we provided an archive of some of the data feeds. This is probably 15, 20 years ago um, for the, the uh, surface and upper air data feed and some of the model data feeds. It was pretty common in those days for people to have internet problems and they'd drop off for an hour or two or their machine crashed or something. And for a long time, we would basically grab the feed and dump it to a file, one per hour, that if you lost the data, you could just FTP somewhere and grab the data, dump it through your LDM, and it would just put everything where it was supposed to go. Um, we stopped doing that a while ago. It wasn't really being used, and if I remember right, the machine that was running it crashed, and when I brought it back up, um, nobody called to complain that it wasn't there anymore, and I said, I guess, I guess we're done doing that, that's okay. Uh, but that was that was pretty cool to have that. Um, in the early days, uh, and I've got some examples coming up here, we got a lot of our uh, analyzed maps through DIFAX. And at one point, one day, DIFAX stopped. And we knew it was coming. We knew they were going to stop. So I had a student hourly that uh, programmed up a significant number of the maps that came over DIFAX uh, using GEMPAC and the data that we got to plot them. So we came, we had our own genuine imitation DIFAX maps. And for a long time, we made those available to the unit data community. I would, we'd create the maps and then pipe them out through the experimental feed to anybody who was interested in, in uh, maintaining uh, the DIFAX maps. Because especially for a lot of the smaller schools, that was their source of, you know, of plotting or of, uh, of maps available for discussions and stuff. So that, that went on for a long time. In fact, I think I've got most of those archived on tape also. Um, and we also were one of the early test relays for the conduit data stream for larger volume uh, volumes of, of model data. Um, the early craft and NextRed 2 uh, distribution of NextRed level 2 data through the uh, IDD. And more recently, the, uh, the satellite feed. I've been working with Tom in terms of you know, playing around with and understanding how that was going to impact the community and how it was going to work. <sighs> the Wayback Machine. So I got to thank Tom for the teletype image. This is how we got data when I was in school, right? It came over a teletype line. I had 4,800 baud from the 1980s. I saw something yesterday. It was as low as 300 bits per second of data that would come through. Uh, it would come from the National Weather Service offices and print out on a teletype machine. And we had students that would go in and cut it off and put it in the, we had one for surface obs, one for upper air observations, which is what these are over here. These are, I think, from the April... 1974 tornado outbreak. Yeah, yeah, let's go back. And then uh, these were some of the different feeds that were available over that. And, and this kind of gives you an idea. I mean, you think now DD plus, okay, that's just DD plus, but it actually stood for the domestic data surface, which was service, which was observations, uh, the public product services, which was more uh, not observations, but forecasts and like climate summaries and, and things like that, warnings. Um, International Data Service was the IDS, and then HDS was the High Resolution Data Service. Uh, we were getting model grids over this uh, family of services at that time. High resolution pretty much was on the order of 80 kilometer grid over the continental US, out to 48 hours, and that was big back then. 
Um, so that was how we got data in the early days. This is a radar summary, right? Uh, it came in over DIFAX. Uh, you can see there's some stuff going on on the East Coast here. No echo. That's just so you don't think that it's broken and there's you know, nothing going on. Uh, that's from 1984. High resolution satellite data, circa 1984. And again, thanks to Tom for the, the wet facts uh, image over there. But this is state of the art uh, distribution of GOES E satellite data in 1984. Looks like we've got a cyclone coming through uh, the mid Midwest right around then. So that's where we started. This is how we had map discussions. You didn't sit at your computer and uh, look at the latest forecast. You stood in front of a dot matrix printer or a wet fax machine waiting for the next run of the, the uh, what was it? It wasn't the ADA model. It was the NGM and the LFM. And the LFM, it's just like, well, are we going to get snow or not? Where is the low? You know, and it would be out to 48 hours, which was, you know, la la land. None of the, you couldn't trust the, the 48 hour forecast. But this was this was where we had map discussions when I was in school. We had a whole the whole side that was uh, forecast maps, uh, four panel maps going out to 48 hours, surface and upper air maps. We had a, a 100 millibar map that for some reason we called it the 850 moon map. I'm not sure if that's a thing or not, but. Anyways, that was where we kind of started. Whoops. This is uh, radar circa probably 1991. Um, that might be a Kavoris machine. I don't remember exactly where we got that, but it was a, just a CRT monitor, uh, and we were able to, I think that was over an acoustic coupler. We called in and got radar data from the local uh, WSR 57 sites. I think there was one in Nina, Wisconsin. I think there was one in La Crosse or Minneapolis. Um, who's that guy right there? Recognize him? You. That's me. Yep. It's, we had a, a local reporter come by and uh, do a storm chasing story with us. And this is like three days later. I'm like, well, I think we've still got the radar imagery, so I'm pretending to tell a storm chasing team where to go. <laughs> front, the front page of the State Journal. What's that? On the phone. Yes. Yep. That was the, uh, the old days of storm chasing. That's another story, though. We'll talk about that tonight. Um, <clears throat> so, around that time, uh, a lot of the uh, data that we got started coming through satellite on the C-band broadcast. It was a sideband on some satellite TV where this data started coming in as opposed to uh, dedicated phone lines. <clears throat> around 1994, it converted to a different format, which involved everybody had to get a new dish and they had to get new hardware. And it was just a lot of places were not able to afford that transition. And there was a lot of concern over how are we going to get data to be able to support our education and research programs. It was really cost prohibitive. I mean, some of the bigger bigger universities probably could have handled it, but a lot, of, a lot of places couldn't. So around that time was when the Internet Data Distribution Service uh, using LDM was envisioned. Uh, the idea was you'd have a couple of places that were able to afford or have NSF sponsor a couple of places to get the data and then broadcast it to a lot of people through the LDM in a sort of a tree structure. So you'd have a couple of top level nodes and they would feed some people and they would feed some people and then everybody throughout Unidata would be able to get uh, whatever data was out there. Um, just to give you some ideas on the, um, the volume of data that we were pushing back then, uh, I did some, uh, I think this was from a proposal or I don't remember exactly where I got this, but around that time, around 1995, all of the data, not including the NextRed, which was a subscription, was between 5 and 15 megabytes per hour. That was for DDS, PPS, IDS, and the high-resolution data service. Um, and if you could afford it, you could pay to have WSI send their NextRed data through the IDD. That was on the order of 20 to 25 megabytes an hour. So let's add that up. If you were getting all of the data, including NextRed, it turns out to be about 1 gigabyte per day of data was what we were pushing in 1995. Um, talking about the uh, UNIWISC, uh, the, the uh, Makaitis data stream and the floater sections that Mohan referred to earlier, like I said, we, it, we, you, anybody could get satellite data for costs from the SSCC data center, but well, we wanted to make uh, satellite data available to the broader community, but I mean, the bandwidth was not that great back then. So when the, as far as I can tell from my archives, when we started sending out that, when SSCC started sending out that data, 
we sent out four kilometer resolution visible on IR imagery and eight kilometer uh, water vapor imagery over basically the North American sector twice an hour. So you get an image at like quarter after the hour and an image at quarter to the hour. Um, and then Millersville uh, and Russ's group would choose an area of weather interest every day where you would get higher resolution data. So we got one kilometer visible during the day, and I think it was still four kilometer IR at night uh, over a small region of interest. So just to give you an idea, what does that look like? Here's a uh, four kilometer visible image of a cyclone over the East Coast. As compared, and this is from, this I actually made from our archive the other day. This is from 1998, 15Z, March 9th, 1998. Here's the floater section for that same thing. So if you compare, they're not quite exactly lined up, but if you compare the the blockiness in the in the clear sector behind to what was going on. But this is it. This is this is the scale of the the high resolution data that we were able to push through uh, given the bandwidth at that time. So that was what we were dealing with back then. Uh, over the years, we added uh, the the IDD has added a number of data streams. Uh, as I mentioned, Craft that was the next ride level two stuff that started around 1998. Uh, Conduit. Uh, there was much higher resolution data out there than um, a lot of places could handle, to be honest. There were a lot of universities that didn't have the bandwidth to, to receive all of the data that was available. Um, so Conduit started as just some of the higher, uh, some of the schools that had better bandwidth would be able to um, get all of the data and then other places would be able to request smaller chunks of it from that, but it would be available. Uh, and of course, when NOAAport came online, all of that data was available too uh, through the various N feeds uh, where that was ingested uh, through a satellite receiver at a number of places and that, that goes on today. Uh, yeah, but you didn't know that Kraft and Conduit were actually acronyms. Maybe, Jeff, you probably knew that. But I'll bet a lot of people didn't know. Collaborative Radar Acquisition Field Test. Cooperative Opportunity for NCEP data using IDD technologies. Those are actually acronyms. I didn't know that. I had to figure that out. So just to, you know, we, Mohan, I thought maybe you stole my thunder earlier when you were talking about just the drastic increase of data. Um, but, you know, around 2000, remember I, we were talking in the 90s, it was about a gigabyte per day. By 2000, uh, we're up to on the order of uh, 12 gigabytes a day just for conduit, uh, but it, at peak. It was about 500 megabytes per hour at peak. Um, just for comparison, well, this I think I wrote this. Th this number actually comes from February, uh, 22,000 megabytes per hour. So we've gone up by, what is that, a factor of 100? Um, 50 on the order of um, just for the conduit data stream. Um, I pulled a number out of a 2006 ILM uh, instructional lab modernization proposal out of Madison. Uh, in, around that time, we were receiving on the order of 27 to 45 gigabytes of data per day across all of our data feeds. So there's another data point. Uh, by 2014, we were averaging on the order of 13 gigabytes an hour that we were bringing in, which is about 312 gigabytes per day. And then um, early in 2019, we were up to between 40 and 70 gigabytes per hour, which is on the order of a terabyte per day. Uh, and I looked at that again recently. I've got a couple of graphs later on to show you this. We're up to between 90 and 95 uh, gigabytes per hour peak when the model, models are coming through in the satellite data. So it's, it's pretty crazy how, how we've gone from you know, a gigabyte per day to like a thousand times that. It's ridiculous. Uh, this is a... Uh, graph of the data coming through one of our IDD worker nodes earlier this year. Um, and you can see we're peaking up close to, when the model runs come through, we're peaking up close to 80 gigabytes per hour. Um, Conduit is, I think, let's see, satellite is probably the biggest winner, but Conduit's up there too. They're both pretty big. There we go. Um, peak of about 22 gigabytes per hour for Conduit. 16 for the sat the GRB satellite feed. So lots and lots and lots of data. 75 gigabytes per hour there. Um, this is just the same graph that I showed you as compared. That was in February. Here's the same graph yesterday. So we're up approaching 100 gigabytes per hour now uh, when the models come through. 
these are just some numbers, even the growth in the last year with the addition of some of the satellite data and some of the other stuff coming through on Conduit. Um, it's about a 50% increase on peak for Conduit since February. Um, similarly, not 50%, but a, a pretty big increase on just the GRB data with GO17 stuff coming through. Um, and so we've peaked from, gone from about 75 gigabytes per hour to approaching 100 gigabytes per hour. Uh, kind of mind-blowing. So just to kind of close up the data uh, access section, you remember what the radar summary we had earlier looked like? It was a DIFAX map. This is what we've got now. Whoops. Uh, go forwards. This is a satellite uh, image circa 2019, a little different than the wet fax black and white version. Um, upper level chart uh, in color and, and done from the GFS analysis. So we, we think we made some progress. I like to keep things. <laughs> this is uh, the archive of data that I have. It's the DD plus uh, Unidata Makaitis feed and the HDS feed going back to about 1996, late 1996. Um, these are the tapes that I've been reading in and giving to Daryl. So if you've seen Daryl talk about the archive that I've been providing to him, that's coming off these tapes. I think I'm up through about 2004 that I've read in all of that stuff, and he's got all that stuff available on the MT Archive site. Um, so if you're looking for old data, he's got it. Um, we decided that it'd be better to get that data off those tapes while I actually have a functional drive. So he's got a copy of it, and I've got a copy of it because, you know, I don't need a file cabinet full of drawers to hold, you know, a couple terabytes of data anymore. So or that's probably not even a couple terabytes. I think each of those tapes is, what, two gigabytes? for exabyte. <clears throat> so then we graduated to CD-ROMs. Uh, somewhere in the early 2000s, I decided it would be better to write them to CDs rather than, than tapes. So I've got spools and spools of uh, NAM and GFS. I think I've got the analysis and all the way out to like nine or 12 hours on all of the different grids that came through. Assuming they're still readable, I'm, I'm guessing. Um, so if anybody needs <laughs> ancient GFS data. Uh, then I decided CDs are kind of expensive, hard drives are cheap, right? So now I've got, this is, you walk in my office and I've got a pile of about 30 hard disks, USB hard drives that have model data, satellite data, I've, I've got tons and tons of stuff on there, so. <clears throat> and then probably about 2014 or 2015, I said, you know, when's the last time I actually read something off of one of these drives? I always go to Daryl's site if I need to pull something down. So I, that, that archive ends in probably about mid-2015, but uh, between the, the RDA at NCAR and Daryl's site and other archive sites, um, I probably don't need to save everything anymore the way I did in, in the olden days. So in Madison, um, we make extensive use of the data and various software tools for our research and education endeavors. Uh, we're still pretty much a gem pack shop. Old habits die hard. Um, Professors have lesson plans and homeworks that are, are hard to change, so a lot of our stuff is still Genpack. Um, one of our professors has sort of dived into the whole Python ecosystem, so and he teaches our junior level classes, so I think we're going to start seeing more of, more of that, and he's very excited about it. Uh, Professor Michael Morgan is really excited about uh, that avenue. <clears throat> so far, I haven't really been able to convince our faculty or researchers to, to do much with IDV or, uh, or AWIPS. I try. I, I'm doing. I, I do my best to to uh, publicize it, but it's 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 taken some time. One of the proposals from your faculty promised to use the IDV. Promised one of the proposals from our faculty was going to use the IDV. Yeah, and it was funded. Recently. <laughs> I'll have to have a talk with them. <laughs> <laughs> You're in trouble. <laughs> um, so yeah, so we make extensive use of the LDM to get the data. Uh, NetCDF to store the data and threads to make the data available to ourselves and the world. Um, we create a variety of website graphics that are used uh, by our classes and also off-site. Anybody can use them. Um, we use the, the model data for initializing local models. We've got uh, uh, somebody still running actually an MM5 run every day. Um, and a wharf run, and we've got Greg Tripoli runs his NMS run every day. A uh, huge amount of data analysis. I know John Young is, or John Martin is doing some really interesting stuff with Northern Hemisphere cold pool stuff that he's using uh, the GFS data to do. So there's, there's lots and lots of use of that at Madison. 
Um, this is a photo from one of our recent weather watches. We uh, have a weather discussion every Friday at noon. Uh, recently, we've been webcasting them, so if you're interested, take a look around 12.15 Central Time uh, at the AOS YouTube channel. That'll be, be live, and you can come on and comment and participate if you're interested. Um, this is John discussing a, a uh, GOES-16 satellite uh, loop. Similarly, talking about one of our upper-level charts that's done with Unidata software and data. And of course, our classes make extensive use. We have a computer classroom with 15 computers in there that have the suite of uh, Unidata software uh, and can access our data through um, various means as well. Um, Gozar was interesting. Um, we had been using the data that came through NOAA port and making some satellite loops that we had gotten pretty used to using. And we were all very excited about GOES-16 and the prospect of more channels and higher time resolution. And the day came when they turned on the GOES-R data and I realized I don't have anything that can read this stuff. I mean, it's not CDF4, but none of my scripts work with it anymore, right? I was either using Makaitis area files or Genie format files that had been coming through various sources and all of a sudden I had nothing that I could read it with. And I'm sitting there, I'm looking at this data coming in, I'm like, man, I really want to check this out. And I remembered being at a user, users committee meeting, talking about Python and the interface with NetCDF and various mapping, and I'm like, I should look, this is a good reason for me to learn Python and start actually doing it. So I did, I, I got a hold of an example script and modified it to actually get it to read the data, and then I got it to actually plot the data, and then I got it to actually put a map on it. Within a couple of hours, I had something up and running, and I think this might actually be one of the first <laughs> Uh, images, that's right, not the greatest contrast, but a, a close-up image over Wisconsin, and I was like, wow, this is really spectacular. Um, after that, it was about two weeks of crack cocaine where I couldn't do anything but more and more and more and more it goes 16 data. It was just like, oh, this IR and water vapor, everything was amazing. Um, so we do have a web page that has a fair amount of uh, satellite imagery over various regions that uses the Python stuff that I wrote, and I'm happy to share that with that code with anybody. One of these days I'll get it up on GitHub. I keep threatening to get it up on GitHub, I just haven't done that yet. Um, okay, so to kind of tie things up here, where, do we, where are we now with data distribution and access, and where are we going? I came across the uh, IDD principles that were sort of outlined, what is this IDD going to be? And what is it gonna look like? How are we gonna govern this thing? How are we gonna do this? Uh, from the Unidata website. These are some of the initial ideas when the IDD was being uh, formulated. Um, one of them was that data reception implies relay responsibilities. The idea was if you could and you were going to get the data, it was your responsibility to try to pass it on to downstream sites, however you could afford that, uh, if you could afford that. Um, and the Unidata Program Center was going to acquire data of high interest, which would be defined by what people were using. I found this to be an interesting sentence. The, the whole, I didn't include a lot of the text that accompanied all of these bullet points, but one of the bullet points said, or one of the, the paragraphs said, unit data acquisition does not imply that the data will flow through the UPC. The UPC will not become a data center or hub for the internet data distribution. <laughs> we'll come back to that. <clears throat> the UPC was going to choose routes for high interest data, and I remember in the olden days where you would talk to someone at Unity, it was either you or Steve or somebody, um, say, I want a, a feed for whatever, and they would point you at a upstream site, and they sort of managed how the IDD was laid out for the really high interest data. Uh, for lesser interest data, they, you could kind of just make stuff up and just you know, feed from whoever. Um, the higher interest categories was going to be defined by who was actually using the data. Um, there were to be incentives and criteria for high level relays. So as I mentioned earlier, we've been a pretty like a top level re relay since the dawn of the IDD. So the source feeds us and then we feed some people and they feed other people and so on. Um, <clears throat> the idea was that top level relays would feed between five and ten second level relays which means they should be able to handle six to 11 times the data volume that they need. In other words, if you want to pull in however much data you can afford on how much your bandwidth can handle, you should be able to send five to 10 times that much out through the same pipe. That was interesting. Um, 
And it was a community endeavor, and they had the idea that the internet was going to involve to make this a little less complicated. That was interesting. Um, I also found the uh, report two years in, and the, the gist of it is, in the first two years, the IDD has been delivering data to universities, and it has been proven to be successful. It's working as we anticipated. And the idea of the IDD being cooperative and shared responsibilities has been proven both val uh, viable and efficient. It was working as expected. That was great. But unit data wasn't going to become a data center. Um, so I pulled this up just the other day. This is the uh, a conduit topology map that you can find on the Unidata RT stats site. And there's a little bit of data sharing going on there, but it's really a star emanating from Unidata. And it makes me a little sad. I mean, in the olden days, it seemed like, you know, there was unit there was Unidata, there was us, there was Penn State, there was Oklahoma, there was I mean a variety uh, Illinois that were top level relays and all of these people were sharing the data among themselves and with downstream sites so that you know anybody could get the data. Over the years, a lot of those top level relays have either through the departments not wanting to support people to, to manage that or you know losing interest in actually acquiring the data. Uh, the number of top level relay sites has gone down and it's really now everybody feeds from Unidata effectively. Um, and that's that's kind of too bad. It would be nice if there was more um, redundancy in the in the feeds. Because if something happens at unit data, we lose everybody loses everything, and that's that's too bad. Um, this is a plot of the latency of the conduit feed uh, after the updates that Carissa was talking about this afternoon. We're we're doing really well. Um, this is what it looked like back in April when we were first noticing this problem. Um, and there you can find each model run uh, on there, each sequence of models. And we we're approaching an hour of latency where we start losing data. So we've made progress on that end. But I mean, as, as more data comes about and as the internet evolves, we're probably going to run into this situation again. And I'm not sure exactly what the answer is. Um, there's a number of issues, and I was talking with Tom about this yesterday, about just Weirdnesses about the network, weirdnesses about the way universities have their networks set up, weirdnesses about equipment that make it really hard to, to diagnose and understand sometimes why the data isn't getting through. So, and over the years, it's just gotten bigger and bigger. It's really not realistic or necessary for every university to get all of the data all the time, every day. And I think we've known this for a while, and probably the reason Threads exists as a thing is because we've seen that. Right? It makes more sense to for a few places to host all of the data and any individual site to just pull down what they're interested in, whether it's a variable at a time, at a height, or a subset of that. Um, so it probably that, that's a data model that I think makes sense, but I think it's still worthwhile having a number of those out there rather than just a couple. Um, uh, yeah, the institutions have sort of, the support for uh, data ingest and relays has sort of waned over the years. Um, Threads is hopefully going to help, and it would be nice to have a lot of uh, geographically diverse data stores out there. One of our recent equipment proposals, we put up a Threads server, and uh, this is threads.aos.wisca.edu. We basically have the same suite of data that's available on the Unidata Threads server. Um, I'm also hoping to include some archival data. I've got some archive data for Hurricane Michael. Um, there was a bad snow forecast and some really cold back in January of this year that's out there. Um, there was a bomb cyclone. Um, apparently, I haven't put that fully up there yet. But my idea is, uh, you know, to have another site that people can go to. I mean, we're talking about the amount of data that's coming out of the unit data between the LDM and threads. It'd be nice to share the load and have, have people like us be able to take on some of that load as well. So I'm not quite sure how to publicize this. Um, there was a Unidata blog article a while ago where we announced the availability of this. And a couple weeks ago, Tom was in Madison for the Makaitis Users Group meeting, and he's like, you know, who's he, uh, do you have any idea how much your server is getting used? And I didn't because I hadn't been looking at any logs or anything. Uh, it turns out the most frequent user of this server is some guy who wrote an iPhone app that pulls in model data every, he's pulling in the whole quarter degree something or other, and it's this big spike. And that's about it. <laughs> Other than me and you know our, our classes and stuff, so um, I'm not sure how to how to get that out there. But 
I guess this is one way. Hit, hit up threads.aos.wisc.edu and uh, help us help us make make it use, uh, useful. So uh, I was going to show some examples of some Go 16 and 17 loops, but I kind of rambled a while and it's getting close to five, so I think I'm going to skip those. Oh. And well, we can show some. There's one. All right, hey, hang on. If you want to hang around, I've got them. Um, I have to go here. Let's see. At least one. Yeah. Whoops. What did I do? That's. Ah, uh, no, I can't get to it. I don't know what I did here, but. Well, go to your thread server now. Yeah. Right. I don't even, oh, my mouse is in the wrong place, isn't it? I'm not sure what I did. Earlier when I just swiped to a different desktop, it swiped and now it's not doing that, so. There we go, that's my problem. Part of my problem. No, that's not going to work. So, well, wait a minute. If I get rid of the thank you and I get rid of the PowerPoint, how many systems administrators does it take to solve a computer problem? Let's close that. There we go. I, think I need to gather my windows. That's my problem. I can do this. No, not the App Store. Go away. It's going to be cool, really. <laughs> here we go. Here we go. This is this is my problem. All right. So there's us, me and my kids at the beach a couple years ago. Go Packers. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Here we go. First loop I ever made over southern Wisconsin. There was a mesoscale vortex over southern Lake Michigan. That was pretty awesome. Ooh, nice. Yeah, that was pretty neat. Uh, let's see. Is that IR? Uh, that was visible. This I thought was neat. This is a mid-level water vapor image. There was a color map thing that made the background cyan, but it kind of wound up like a treble clef or something over the middle of the U.S. Mm -hmm. That I thought was pretty cool. Uh, this is some convection over, zoomed in over southern Wisconsin and northern Illinois mm -hmm. near sunset. See all the different gravity waves in there. Ne never ceases to amaze me, this... this uh, High resolution. Oh, and the white. Yeah, when the when the GOES imagery first started coming through, the greater than one values were right. marked as missing. So there was black pepper in the middle of everything. So I made everything white, and that just meant at night it got dark. This is a close-up image of Hurricane Maria. Um, I had done a farther out image of this and posted it to several social media places, and I was contacted by Ada Manzon. She's uh, in Puerto Rico, and she said, hey, is there any chance we could get a real close-up of that? So I went back and pulled the data and, and made this loop for her. I think she actually showed this at the AMS conference in uh, 2018 in Phoenix. No. Seattle? It wasn't in Boston. Austin. Austin, thank you. But yeah, no, she uh, she was in, they, because the radar got wiped out, she was interested in correlating this with some observations that she had, they had talked to some people on the ground and she wanted to co-locate what was going on uh, in the satellite imagery with what people were telling her on the ground. So that was a, a pretty awesome image. This one's neat. These bore waves coming over the Gulf yeah, the down there. Yeah, look at that. That was pretty awesome. And then the convection Boring. over Florida's. Ah, but uh, this was cool. The snow melt, the solar shovel is in uh, full effect there. <laughs> that was cool. But that's black and white. Color is cool. So there's a color, color image of the same thing, just through the afternoon. This was kind of cool. Um, I basically mapped the individual floater sites. I'm going to speed this up a little bit. Uh, mapped the floater sites. This is for Hurricane Michael, I believe. No, not Michael. Michael's now. What is this? Alberto. Alberto as it came on shore and, and dumped. So you can, basically it's the same region with the, the one minute mesoscale imagery going for like three days, I think.
This is an MCC forming in the Dakotas and <laughs> Yeah. This is a puff. There's like this puff of stuff that comes off the Black Hills over there. High, high quality yeah, graphics there. <laughs> <laughs> this little, little puff thing just came off and, and Turkey was long lived. I don't know what that. All the time. I don't know what that was, but that was kind of cool. And it persisted. I mean, it's still there. This is a convective band that formed over southern Wisconsin. Uh, one minute mesoscale imagery. This kind of thing makes it so much easier to teach satellite meteorology. Mm -hmm. We, ha I have a bunch of these on the uh, the AOS YouTube channel. I've got a whole list of of, of this stuff up there. So. Yeah, students aren't. It, it's hard to convince to take the class. Yeah. Let's see. This is Hurricane Florence. Just sits and rains on the East Coast. Let's see, what is that? Michael. There's, yeah, there's Michael. This really does need a soundtrack, right? Like Pink <laughs> Floyd or some. <laughs> Oh, this is one where I had it moving. I had it actually following the track. I think I, that actually starts down here. This starts back in the early days. Anyways, I can just let these run. I had a thank you slide that I nuked to be able to get back to this, so that's not there anymore, but thank you, and uh, I'll take any questions. Thank you. Any questions for okay. Kevin. Kevin. Uh, great presentation, and thanks, and more of a comment, but... You know, you and me and, and Harry Edmund and, and Daryl, I mean, I mean the, the positions that we have had, um, I just think is, is so important to the community. And, you know, I just, it, it's, no, it's no coincidence that I think we all end up serving with uh, Unidata. Um, and just hope that... Um, departments and universities and programs and I think with with the advocacy of, of folks like you who are at universities um, can continue to advocate because you know we're, we're part of what makes this this whole community effort possible thanks for a great presentation yeah, yeah we have a stake in it and it, we we're passionate about trying to continue it help a new new uh, generation of scientists and administrators and software developers feel that way too Thanks for a great presentation, Pete. Uh, this came up a little bit earlier in our uh, uh, meeting, but uh, from your perch, are you seeing a generational gap in embracing new tools, new approaches to using data, using services and software? Um, if you mean the younger people are more likely to adopt new technologies, yes as opposed to those of us entrenched in how we do things. Yeah, I think, huh? Yeah, I, I think there's definitely a generational gap. 
uh, in terms of the way they interact with software, in terms of, you know, I was thinking about this. I, I teach an introduction to Unix class every fall, and, you know, I, I, I talk to them about, you know, the command line and stuff, and it occurs to me most of them probably don't sit at a computer very regularly. They don't, you know, the, the concept of switching between applications and things is foreign to them. They're on their phone, and they just touch an icon, and it comes up, and it's a very different ecosystem that they work in. This is a cool loop. This is a real close-up of... That might be Hurricane Michael also, yeah, it's yeah, cool. of the eye wall and the, the eye. But yeah, it's really different. The, the way I think about interacting with computers is very different from the way people 20 years younger than me, 30 years younger than me interact with them. Hmm. Any other questions for Pete? Well, let's thank him one more time. Thank you, Pete. Thanks.